The Get Rich Slow Club podcast is a collaboration between Tash Etchman from Tash Invest and Anna Christina from Perla. The Get Rich Slow Club acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land we record on. From coast to coast, across land, waters and communities, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Any advice is general and does not consider your financial situation, needs or objectives. So consider whether it's appropriate for you. Welcome to the Get Rich Slow Club podcast, where we take you from beginner to confident investor, where we can teach you everything you need to know about investing. So come get rich slow with us. Welcome back. Today's episode, we answer some questions we've been getting on social, everything from investing in super, banking interest rates, and money taboos. But like always, we're going to kick off this episode with our weekly money win and losses. Tash? My, I always feel like I'm in trouble when you say Tash like that. My one for the week. I found a rental in Sydney for a few months. It's $400 a week, which seems pretty pricey as someone coming from Perth, but it's close to the beach. Um, it's like a five minute walk to the beach, which is very cool for Sydney. It's a master room and it has an ensuite, which is very exciting. And I'm going to save money from, I've got a lot of things planned in Sydney over the next few months. So I'm going to save money on flights. So I think that's a win. And you have beach views. So that's always yes. a win in my books. Yes, <laughs> there are interviews. Yeah, premium in Sydney. <laughs> oh, great. I also have a, a money win. I signed up for my local toy library. Do you know what a toy oh, library is? Yes, I used to go to one when I was like a kid. I think my mom volunteered, but I haven't heard about toy libraries in so long. Oh, they're amazing. So it was $100 to sign up for the year with a $40 bond. And you can take out three toys per child. So six in total, because I've got two kids, and um, you can have it for two weeks, which I thought was fantastic. So we got a couple puzzles, a couple building toys, and the kids have been loving them. And it's, yeah, I, I think it's a total win, $100. And you get, I literally got to take home six toys the first day. Win, win, yeah, win. Yeah, that's a, all around. amazing. And so cool getting to go in and swap them and see what other things are there. It's like Christmas every two weeks. Exactly. And also it, you just don't have to buy new toys and create more garbage. So I love the environmental kind of impact of that as well. And making the most of the toys while you have them instead of having toys all the time, just kind of sitting in your house. Kids just grow out of toys so fast too. So it's, it's a huge, huge win. Yeah, we both have wins for this week. Great. Yay. <laughs> So let's kick off this show. Um, we've got some really awesome questions and I'll read the first one. I'm currently investing 60 per week into a 60-40 split of Oz and international ETFs. The rest of my savings are going towards buying my first home this year, which I'd love to live in for two years before turning it into an investment property so that I can get some income while studying for a master's degree. I love traveling, so I really want to find a way to see the world while still being able to grow my finances. Does this sound okay? I love that you've started investing $6 a week. What a great start. Um, I think the biggest point here is to remember that you can't do everything at once and you will need to prioritize. There's that saying, I think you can have everything, just not all at the same time. Uh, there are different seasons of your life and it's okay to prioritize investing after uni. Your master's degree is an investment in your future. Um, I started investing when I was 18, but I didn't start consistently investing until after I bought my apartment. So I prioritized saving my deposit and then I invested mostly after that. I couldn't agree with you more. I spent most of my 20s traveling and that was a huge investment in myself and being able to see the world, check out different places and also be in university at the same time. You know what's best for you and this sounds like a really fantastic start, especially since you're already creating important habits around investing, saving for your first home, education. Those huge things are going to pay dividends in the long term. Not dividends, just investment dividends, but dividends in terms of your earning capacity and so forth. So thank you so much for sharing this one. I love hearing people starting their financial journey. Yeah, this one's amazing. It sounds like you've considered lots of different things. And I love hearing stories of people starting with smaller amounts, like $60 a week. I think we sometimes get distracted by people investing thousands at a time, but you can start really small. So I love this. Not even really small. God, $60 is still a lot, but you can start smaller, I guess. Um, next question. I'm basically building my family's wealth slowly through ETFs, mainly ASX VAS. So my question is two parts. Should I have a couple on the go, like one that tracks American stocks, as well as my VAS that tracks the Aussie market? Or is it better to focus on one that you are happy with? So Vaz only invests in the ASX 300, which means it's the largest 300 companies in Australia. There is a bit of lack of diversification across countries if you are only investing in this specific ETF. 
it might be good to consider exposure to other markets around the world. Diversifying is a way to reduce your risk and there's a few different ways to diversify. So like Anna said, geographically, invest across different countries. You can invest across different assets like stocks, bonds, property, and cash. Like I know Vaz is just shares or stocks and also across sectors like healthcare, tech, and finance. So Vaz is only diversified across sectors, but not across asset classes or geographically. I think with the Australian ones as well, it's important to have a look and realize it's not actually that diversified across sectors. Like it's mostly banks and mines that make up a lot of VAS. A little hack here is to have a look at portfolios from super funds, raise, stock spot, diversified ETFs like VDHD to see how they diversify across assets and regions. Diversification is a really important strategy to have when you're investing. So this is is a really great question because a lot of people think, hey, I've invested in one ETF. ETF is a basket of um, shares and I'm good. But it's always valuable to go back and take a look at that and have a really good understanding of what you're investing in. Like Tash said, Australia is a very specific country that has specific sectors in its allocation. So it's also important to remember that Australia is such a small part of the overall economy as well. It's nothing like the US, which controls a lot more. So it's important to consider other countries too. Next question. Hi, Tash and Anna. I just started listening to your podcast. I have one question for you to cover. Today, ING Bank's interest rate is 5%, whereas ETFs are 3 to 7% and also unstable. Do you still think investing in shares and ETFs are better than bank interest rates? Thanks so much in advance. There's a few things to consider here. The first one is the total return. So if you're looking at ETFs, the dividends plus capital growth and what that is. Um, So I think it's like 7% over the longer term if we're using a conservative number, but it can be higher. Also, yes, ING's interest rate is high now, but what about the longer term? Plus, there's always so many hoops you need to jump through to get those interest rates. With ING, I know you need to have a five-card transaction and you have to deposit $1,000 from an external source every month. Are you able to also reach these requirements in order to get the higher interest rate? The other thing that's really important is to consider your goals. Are you investing or saving for long-term or is it short-term? And how does that kind of play in your whole strategy? Savings accounts also don't keep up with inflation, so it's another thing to consider. And um, go have a listen to episode five, where we talk about saving versus investing. This might cover a couple of your questions and how to think about this topic. The next question, I've just demolished your new podcast, excited to keep listening. I have a question that I wonder if you might cover at some stage. The question is, top up super or invest in ETFs? Is it sort of equivalent? Depends on your super and how it's structured. It's a tax win, but I don't know how to make the comparison. Oh, I love this question. This could be a whole episode in itself. And I actually think that we're going to do that in the future. So stay tuned. But some of the things that are really important to consider is your income and what tax bracket you're in. The other thing is the tax benefit that you could get from investing in your super. Also, when you when do you want to access this money? If it's something that you want to access sooner rather than later, you might not want to invest it in your super. But if you're just waiting until your preservation age or when you retire, then super might be more advantageous. Also, what are your goals? What are you planning on doing with this money? How do you want to use it? Another thing to note is super is taxed at 15%. So again, this kind of plays into what tax bracket you're in and how to think about the two. There's lots of things to consider. Personally, I don't add anything extra into my super currently, but I will reconsider this in the next few years. Um, At the moment, I want the flexibility of being able to use my investments in the shorter term, but I know this isn't making the most of the tax benefits available. So it's definitely a really personal decision. What do you do, Anna? I used to salary sacrifice and utilized the money that I invested for my first home super saver scheme. That was the whole focus on it. I do have some money invested in my retirement account in Canada. I have some money in my super, and I'm kind of happy with where both of those are. I do know that when I return to work, because right now I'm on parental leave I am working a little bit on the side, but my income is much, much lower. When I am at a higher tax bracket, that's when I think it's important for me to run the numbers and see how much I could save based on investing into my super. So that's when I'll pull out the spreadsheet and actually run the numbers. (laughs) I heard someone explain it really well, where it's like you can kind of access your super from 60 if you meet some conditions. So you only really need to invest outside of super until 
60, which for me is like 35 years away. And then after 60 is the next 40 years that you might live still. Um, So it is very important to still consider it, but it is very far away for some of us. Yeah, it's a great way to think about it. And some people in the FIRE community, which is financial independence, retire early, think about their super and investing outside of super and in super, basically filling that gap of how can you live off of your investments until you do reach super, because then you'd ideally leave, live off of your investments from super. Not sure if that answers that question specifically, but uh, just a different way to think about it. We will definitely talk about this in a future episode because there's just a lot to cover. All right, let's jump to our next question, which is also about super. Hi, Tash and Anna. Happy Tuesday. I see you talk about adding money to super in a good way to reduce taxes. So I have started checking my super lately and my investment returns for the previous year. And it doesn't look like I had gotten a 7 to 9% return on my super. I'm with Host Plus. And instead, it looks more like a 1% to 1.5%. Do you know anything about how super investments work? Does it use compounding interest or not? Thank you. Very good question. There's a few things to consider here. Super isn't automatically invested into shares. There are different portfolio types with different risk tolerances. So check which portfolio you're in. Um, Is it high growth, conservative growth? These have a different mix of asset classes and the higher the allocation to cash and bonds, the lower the return may be. Also, some ethical options may have had lower returns recently. So go and check your investment option to see where your money is actually invested. Compound interest is your money making more money. So yes, it will continue to compound just at a slower rate. The other thing to remember is that returns on investments aren't the same year after year. Often you hear the number 7% getting thrown around and that's because that's the average over 20 years. Some years it may be 1.5%, other years it might be 15 and sometimes it might be negative 20. So it might not make sense to look at just the last year, but look over your investments over a longer period of time. Some super funds also give you free access to financial advisors to give you advice about your super fund. So maybe reach out to Host Plus and see if that's something that they offer. And you can talk to someone who can actually see inside your portfolio with you. Next question. Hi, Tash and Anna. How many ETFs do you have in your portfolio? Oh my, I think I have about 15 in my Canadian accounts when I first started investing and didn't know what I was doing. And maybe I have about six in my Australian accounts. I only actively invest in one at the moment and I'm happy with the diversification that I have. That's something that I've absolutely considered and feel as though I am quite diversified when it comes to my portfolio. I do have some cash and bonds as well. And um, that kind of helps to ensure that I have a less of a bumpy ride when it comes to volatility in the market. I had the same kind of reaction as you. I have way too many ETFs as well, um, but I only actively invest in four different ETFs at the moment. I've changed my mind a lot and it's not been worth selling them previously, but I might look to consolidate and make my tax life easier in the future. My poor accountant has to fill out like a page for every single ETF and some just have like $500 in them. So I should probably look at that. Um, But it's important to remember that the number of ETFs doesn't matter to a certain extent. It's better to consider what the ETFs actually invest in. For example, VDHD invests across asset classes and countries, whereas VAS just invests in Australian companies. So there's no one specific number of ETFs. It's what your overall portfolio looks like. Yeah, for sure. I wish I had less than 15 plus. (laughs) To be honest, if I would go back in time, I think maybe one ETF would do the job of what I needed those 15 to do. But we are all learning and they would look so shiny and fun sometimes. (laughs) Next question. Hey there. Quick question. Obviously just general advice and hypothetical. If you were to pay your credit card balance off before the statement was issued, would you pay any interest? So credit cards have an interest free period of up to 55 days. So have a read of your credit card statement to check when your interest free period is or reach out to your card provider if unsure. We talk about this in episode 16. So absolutely go have a listen. I've never paid interest on my credit card because I always pay it off by the due date. Um, But make sure you check your statement to see when those dates are. Australians have accrued a whopping $17.73 billion in credit card debt in March 2023. So if you can pay off your whole balance, you really should. I know we talked about compounding in relation to super previously, but compounding also works on debt. So if you don't pay off your credit card, the interest on your credit card will continue to compound as well. It's just something to be mindful of. So like we said, it's best to pay off all your debt in full if you can or as quickly as possible. And if you're not sure when it's due, definitely reach out to your card provider to double check so you don't get that big interest charge on it. And automate. That's the other thing if you can. 
Definitely. <laughs> Next one. Hi there. Love the podcast. Just wondering, can you make an episode about changing your mind about an investment after some time and how the options pan out? For example, invest in other things instead and take the dividends and reinvest them somewhere else versus just selling completely and putting that money elsewhere. The first thing to do is to make sure that you don't have your dividend reinvestment plan, or as we refer to as drip on. And that any dividends that you do receive go straight to your bank account. That way, nothing will be reinvested and you actually are getting all your cash straight into your account. If you do plan to sell the shares or ETFs, be mindful of any tax implications that you may need to pay um, on your capital gains tax. So this is something if you decide, you know what, I don't want to hold this ETF anymore and I'm planning on selling it, you will be paying capital gains tax. So it's just really important to think about that. I've changed my mind a lot. And so far, I've just held the ETFs and just bought new ones. I don't use a dividend reinvestment plan. So I just manually reinvest my dividends myself. But whether you sell or not depends on your overall investment portfolio, goals, and plans. It's worth chatting to an accountant about the tax implications of selling and weighing up the pros and cons for you. Uh, there's a good reason why I have 15 plus ETFs. It's because I haven't sold them all and consolidated them and am just taking the cash and buying the things that I want to look into. In terms of my strategy, I thought that it made more sense for me to continue to buy the ETF that I want to invest in because then the percentage that's allocated to the rest of my portfolio becomes smaller and smaller and I'm not that worried about that. So that's just how I'm thinking about my own strategy. I, instead of selling the ETFs that I'm not interested in, I'm investing in the ones that I am. And then the percentage that I hold of the ETFs that I'm not interested in, but still hold, become smaller and smaller as I invest more and more into the ETFs that I want to hold in my portfolio. Might not be the best strategy for everyone, but that's what's working for me. That's kind of what I've done as well. And it's such a good way to look at it. And I also know that I might change my mind again. So I don't want to sell everything, buy everything again, and then just keep repeating that process. If I could just keep buying the new ones in the future, because none of them are bad investments. I feel like I'm just refining my strategy. And there are, are some portfolios that hold thematics and thematics are specific themes that people hold, uh, such as focusing more on battery, AI, computers, gaming, crypto. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All of those. And it might be that you're still interested in holding that, but that percentage will get smaller and smaller as you continue to invest elsewhere. Or if you want to invest in those, that percentage will get bigger and bigger in regards to your whole portfolio. So I think it's really important to just look at your portfolio as a whole as well. We touched on this a lot more in episode 10. You've invested for 30 years. Now what? Um, that goes through how to sell and some more considerations as well. So go have a listen to that. Hi, Tash and Anna. Hope you are well. What is the main reason driving your transparency regarding money issues? I'm Zimbabwean and talking about money is very taboo, but having lived in Australia for a while and realizing you can actually talk about money and not lose anything has rocked some of my family's world. What has been some of your negative experiences and how did you overcome them? This is a really interesting question. Uh, to preface, talking about money has been overall beneficial and I think we all need to talk about it more. But of course, there have been some challenges to openly sharing my personal finances online. Uh, one of the more recent ones I've kind of come across is talking about owning property on TikTok. Um, there's a bit of a belief that some people hold that all landlords are bad and you cannot be a good landlord and you shouldn't invest in property. So it's been a bit of a tough one to navigate. And also just assumptions around things like daddy's money or things like that, where you can see that people have their own beliefs and insecurities around money and they like to share those. Um, but I think it's just those negative comments that are the more negative things, but overall it's quite positive. Tash, because you do talk so much about money online, how do you navigate that negativity internally? I used to get quite upset by it because I'd always lived in like a bit of a bubble, I guess. Like I, my parents openly spoken about it. I was really supportive. I spoke about it with my friends and they were supportive too. Like I'd never experienced that negativity, but I think it was just realizing that other people have other money stories and other internalized beliefs about money. And that's not my fault or anything to do with me really. And yes, it's going to be triggering for some people to hear me happily talking about money online while they might be in a stressful situation. Um, so it's just kind of changing the mindset around that. 
and being grateful for the engagement, I guess. When people comment things like that, other people will back me up and then I've got lots of comments about it. So it can be a positive still. That is the hard part I find is that people can be in a different place in their life than you and you talking about money might not be a welcome to them. So I found something similar happened to me in the sense that I was really open about pay transparency in my last job. I was open to talking to people about it and I had people in the company who were happy to talk to me about it. And there was someone you on my team that I started chatting with and I said, Hey, if you'd like, I'm happy to share my, my pay with you. If, if you would like to know, if you want to talk about salary transparency and they said, I need to think about it. And they came back to me and they said, I don't actually want to talk about our salaries. And I said, okay, that's fine. And I needed to respect that because what I found was that sometimes people aren't ready to have those conversations because we all have our own limiting beliefs. We all have our thoughts around money. And to be honest, there's been a couple of times in my career where I've had open conversations about my salary with other people. And I realized that I'm the lowest paid person in that room. And that was hard. That was really hard to hear that other people are making more money than me, even though we're doing the exact same job. But the thing is, it's not their fault. Not talking about money and not being transparent actually only keeps people in power who have the power. And as an employee, you don't have the power to be able to talk about some of these things unless you want to be open and transparent. So similar experiences, the sense that people weren't ready to have that conversation. Well, it might've been really hard hearing that you were the lowest paid. I think it's really important to have those conversations because it's hard to ask for a pay rise or to know that you can get paid more if you don't know that other people are getting paid more. Exactly, exactly. And it's not anyone else's fault that I was getting paid less. In fact, it empowered me to ask for a raise and to argue that I needed one. And eventually I did get it. And I left for another job that paid me more because I knew my worth. And I Amazing. wouldn't have known that had I not had open conversations with my colleagues. I think we attach so many emotions and shame and negative feelings to money that it can be hard to see it objectively as well and being like, okay, this is a fact. I can go and ask for a pay rise. I can get a new job. This is what I can do with this information. When we kind of, a lot of value is placed on money and a lot of worth, if that's how you kind of view money and pay too. But yeah, just stepping back and realizing that, oh, okay, I can like use this information, but some people also aren't ready for that if they haven't had these conversations before. I do look back to that moment when I found out that I was underpaid um, with this colleague who did ask, do you want to know how much I'm earning? Do you want to have this conversation? And I really appreciated that because I could have done the exact same thing that this other person said and said, no, I need a moment. I'm not sure. Actually, no, I don't want to know. And just empowering the other person to be able to take part in that financial conversation is really important. Yeah. I had this conversation at my old job before I left because I was getting paid a little bit more than some others. And they didn't realize that they could have even negotiated because it's a healthcare role. So before I left, I was having those conversations and just saying like, oh, look, you can um, negotiate a little bit more. Like they are open to it. And there are different things that you can negotiate. It doesn't just have to be your wage and your pay. It can be how many vacation days you have. It can be other flexible hours or so forth. There's so many other things that you can negotiate and it should be something that you should consider. There's also another story that I have, and it goes back to your comment, Tash, where you said about this belief that landlords are bad. At one point, I had a property in Canada that I was renting out, and I didn't raise the rent in years because I was really happy with the tenants that I had, and I didn't want to because I wanted to keep them happy, and I wanted to keep them there. And once they did move out, I did raise the rent at the market level. I didn't really go any higher or anything. And um, I had a just really frank conversation with a friend about it who was renting at the time in Vancouver. This friend then, you know, said that I was a capitalist and landlords are bad and, you know, Mm -hmm. um, didn't believe that. Yeah, all the things. And I felt really sad about this because I've tried everything that I possibly can to be a good landlord. In fact, I just sold that property. And when I did, I hooked those tenants up with a little present as as a thank you and a sorry that they, that I had to displace them due to selling it. And this, these aren't things that I need to do. And, but for me, it was really hard to kind of grapple with this idea of being a bad landlord when really that apartment used to be my home. It's just circumstance that I ended up moving away 
but I also want to be part of the solution. I want to be a good landlord and make a difference there. So it's just something that I struggled with quite a bit as well. Yeah, I definitely feel the same because I, the same as you, didn't raise my rent for two years. I bought them gifts. I always fix things straight away, which I think you should do anyway as a landlord. But I'm trying to be the best landlord that I can. And I don't feel like I, like us personally, having one or two investment properties is really the cause of the rental crisis. Like some people might think it is. And those generalizations can be quite harmful as well. Like I did the same. I lived in it. I moved out because I wanted to move into state and now I rent it, but I rent while renting it out. So I feel like it's quite equal, but yeah, it's definitely interesting when someone attacks you overall, when you are trying to be the best that you can be. Yeah. So those are some of the challenges and taboos that we've faced and I really love this question because it doesn't get talked about en enough. You know, we do talk about the positive side of being open about finances and how it can be quite positive, but the negative side is, is really hard sometimes too. Yeah. There's still a long way to go with normalizing money conversations, but I think we should all still do it. Be brave. Talk about money. Just know that some people aren't quite there yet. Yeah. Maybe just ask them if they're yes. ready to have those yeah. conversations. That's what I've learned at least. So, okay. All right. What's the action of the week? Leave us a voice question. I'll pop it up on our Instagram stories and maybe in our links as well, if I can. Um, we love getting audio questions. They're so much fun to answer. Oh yes. We want to hear your voice. Please do that. Well, thanks for joining us. I love these Q and A episodes. So send us lots more. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. If you found this episode helpful, please rate us five stars, write a review, or share with a friend. If you're new to investing, make sure to listen to our first 10 episodes. Follow us at Get Rich Slow Club or Tash at Tash Invest or me at Anna Christina. This show was brought to you by Natasha Edgman, who is an authorized representative, 12-99881 of Guideway Financial Services, AFSL 420367 and Perla, who is an authorized representative, 1281540 of Sanlam Private Wealth, AFSL 337927. Knowledge is power, especially when it comes to investing. So make sure you check out our financial services guides and read the product disclosure statement and target market determination for any investments you're considering. See our show notes for more info.